Welcome, everyone. This is yet another episode of Disruption Talks. And just like every Tuesday, we bring you a total expert who will shed some light on the particulars of their specific industry. In this case, we are going to be talking about something that is part and parcel of everyone's life, regardless of geographical location or anything that impacts your life. It's food, or rather, ordering food. So joining us today is Bharat Chinamantur from Chow Now, the newly appointed Chief Technological Officer. Hi, Bharat. Hello, Philip. How are you? I'm, I'm, I'm great. I see it's sunny behind you. It's also not too shabby over here. So, uh, so a good day, essentially, both sides, right? Yes, yes. Uh, it's a beautiful day in Seattle. Beautiful day in Seattle. Great to have you. Um, but before we start discussing Chow Now, what we always like to do is get the audience closer to you and vice versa. So your personal context, you are a absolute CDO rock star for hire, so to say. You have been at uh, Charles Schwab, you have been at Amazon, at Blink Health, recently in Zipcar, and right now at Chow Now. And what interests me is, can every CTO be expected to exude such versatility? Because it seems that the T in the CTO for you is universal and doesn't matter if you're touching ordering food, managing car rentals, coordinating things like Amazon or Charles Schwab, a completely financial aspect. It seems to work for you. So I want to know what's the secret sauce? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Philip, for that question. And once again, uh a very warm welcome and uh, you know to all the participants on the live broad screen and and thank you yes uh, i think there are a few common themes you know you're right when you sort of lay out all the different domains of amazon to chow now one could you know get the impression that you know this is very fungible and you can sort of move between domains but there are a few common themes uh, the most important theme in the cto roles is to be both a well-versed technology leader and also a people leader, like they go hand in hand. And one of the many things of or the many things that I've learned from Amazon, one of them has always been the ability to sort of invent, to be relentless about results, to have like bias for action. So almost all of those things or those elements are sort of common uh, across all the different roles. The second thing I would say very briefly is uh, most companies, when they hire a, a CTO, uh, there is a certain mandate like, hey, we need you to do X, Y, and Z. And typically what's common about X, Y, and Z is you can replace X with scaling. Hey, we need, to, we need, to, we need you here because we need to scale our people processes or we need to scale our technology talent or we need to scale our e-commerce checkout, or we need to scale our system. So there's a scaling component to it, right? That's one. Uh, I personally like uh, the Y component. If you look at X, Y, and Z, the Y for me is some kind of a turnaround. Like there has to be a transformative challenge, like taking on something, not that it has to be sort of broken and you've got to fix it. It can be you know, good and trying to take it to great, but there has to be a transformative element uh, in that. And, and the third part of it is the mission has to inspire you, right? That's very critical. For one to be successful, the, the mission of the company and the industry vertical they are part of has to inspire you. So if you can lay up all that, that's very common. So Amazon is very transformational. China has such an inspiring mission. Uh, Blink Health was focusing on you know, solving long pending problems in prescription healthcare. Zipcar is such a unique brand. They are environmentally conscious. They really are driving for reduced car ownership. Uh, they're part of a very large parent, the Avis Budget Group. But So all of them have transformative missions, uh, powerful purposeful missions, a transformative opportunity, and the level of scaling. So that's common across uh, all of them. Okay, the X, XYZ principle. I, no, I love it, you can ABC. <laughs> no, but it's very I, essentially, it's, it depends on you. You can go ABC, D, E, F. Like you can find a lot of commonality, but I, I thought for the purpose of this audience, keeping it to three would probably make sense. Okay, no, I, I like that. And it's very, very quotable. So our growth. Yeah. So happen. scaling, scaling, uh, 
uh, and you know very transformative purposeful mission is very important and some kind of a turnaround okay um so of course we've listed quite a few companies that are head turners known brands and logos but let's face it amazon is the largest so please allow me to focus on that and i'm curious the transferable skills and learnings between Amazon and Chow now. Can you walk me through that? Of course, I'm yeah. sure there are some, but are there some, for example, that surprised you, some that you didn't expect or yeah. is it? So there's a little bit of a backstory here that I need to first share, right? So um, I interviewed with Amazon in December 2006, a long time ago. I flew from Bangalore to Seattle for the interviews because there was no loop for a director of software development in India that we could construct. So I had to fly down to Seattle. So obviously a short trip, like a couple of days or four days. But leading up to the trip, I spent a lot of time reading up on amazon.com. And at that point, you know, Amazon was public for over 10 years. In 2006, they did about $10 billion in revenues. So it was quite a large company by then. Of course, it's like unimaginable to what the size is today. Uh, but as part of my research, I read every single public filing on Amazon, starting with the S1 filing in 97 and every single annual report. So I walked in with a, a sense of how this company has been changing and transforming. And it's probably nobody sort of knew where Amazon was headed in 2006. Definitely the stock market didn't believe the story, right? Uh, Stock price was in the low $30 range, and it had sort of meandered around 10, 20 bucks, 30 bucks for over five years. So it was a real uh, situation where the company had sort of put in a lot of effort in building and scaling, but the street did not know it. Nobody knew about it. And so when you, after spending 11 years at Amazon from you know 2007 to 18, I did four different roles. Uh, I came in as a, you know, uh, as an exec leading Chennai, leading three different orgs in, in Seattle. So we moved uh, from you know, Chennai, India to Seattle in 2009. So one thing about Amazon is everything is out in the public. Like it, there's no secret. Like they are, there is a mystique to how they do things. But over the last four or five years, if you Google about Amazon, read the books from Brad Stone or read everything else, everything is out in the public. And if you look at every single of Jeff Bezos' shareholder letters from you know, the beginning of time, 97, every year he has a new format, but the 97 letter is always preserved. And what comes out is Amazon is basically a collection of leadership principles, what is called as LPs. And there are 14 of them, maybe it's now 15. Uh, and these leadership principles, uh, for example, are like bias for action, customer obsession, deliver results. There is an inherent tension between these LPs. And there are many other people who now have spoken about this at, you know, at length on you know, not just YouTube, but on LinkedIn and other uh, sources. So there's also a couple of books now on this. Uh, there's a working backwards book. So there's a lot of body of knowledge about Amazon. But now getting back to your original question, what is that about Amazon that translates well to Chow now is today Amazon is a very large company, but you, know, you have to put yourself back and go back in time and look at 97 or 98 or 99 and 2000, right? Those three or four foundational years for Amazon post IPO. And it was a very furious space. I was you know, not part of that journey. I joined in 2007, but the leadership principles that matter is all around how do you scale? How are teams purposeful about building something with autonomy? How do you make sure that the architecture of the systems and services matches where the customer demand is and what the team needs? So those principles are all there in the LPs. And when you look at that, they're all very, very fungible. So a, a, a very simple concrete example is like customer obsession. And customer obsession is you know, holding yourself really to a very high bar of making sure you're doing the right thing for the customer. And that means the investments in delighting your customers don't go away. They are there with you forever. So there are hundreds of teams now improving the customer experience on the website. So at Chow now, we are much smaller, 
but we have a very purposeful, dedicated team to improve the diner experience. Uh, and that squad, as we call it, spends all their time obsessing over it. And if you look at Spotify, you look at Uber, you look at you know a dozen other companies, they have different names for them, for these squads. Some call them mission teams. Amazon calls it two pizza teams. You know, we call it squads. But that construct of having a purposeful, deliberative strategy to go after an aspect of the customer experience that does not change. And that is one example of what you, know, you can sort of translate over uh, from Amazon into to something like uh, any startup. And in China, we have been slowly scaling up with the number of squads. And we're getting to the point where we are very, very thoughtful about investments we need to make uh, across different customer segments. And, Restaurant partners are a segment. Diners are a segment, right? So it's not just one customer. I I have to I have to confirm. Uh, I remember the time when I moved to the UK for my university studies, and having not used Amazon before as my go-to e-commerce provider, uh, it was quite a revolutionary experience. Not to say that the previous solutions were bad, but just like you said, with obsession just comes going not even the extra mile, but being yeah. prepared to go the extra 20 miles. So absolutely confirmed there. But perhaps enough about Amazon, dive into Chow Now. Uh, what is it about Chow Now that made you join the team? I've read your post and I've heard this from you, but I'm sure that the audience would love to hear what was the, the, the trigger that made you decide yeah. this is it. So a little bit of a backstory. Uh, I left Blink in... Um, uh, in August of 2020, and uh, in a post-pandemic, or the middle of the pandemic, rather. And I had not taken a sabbatical in a long time, so I really wanted to spend some time with family. Uh, you know, my daughter is a, is a senior now in college, but she was staying with us and sort of taking classes from home. It was kind of an interesting time for all of us. Uh, and so when I took some time off, I started thinking through what I wanted to do next, and uh, somewhere around December last year, I started reading up on what's happening with the restaurant industry. And if you just Google on Wall Street Journal, or if you even if you go to uh, get.chowno.com, which is our sort of our landing page and our uh, website for our restaurant partners to know and discover our offerings, there's a lot of links uh, to different aspects of the industry. And the more I read about it, I felt, you know, food is such an intimate part of the human experience like there is you can't live without it right uh, and we we like different kinds of cuisine and over the last you know maybe 20 30 years you know eating out and sampling different cuisines and eating in different locations and traveling to different places to sample the local cuisine has become part of the experience so when i read about the challenges the industry was facing uh, through the pandemic some of it was, you know, really heartbreaking, right? We, we had a lot of restaurants that had to completely shut down. We had some restaurants who could manage with some level of takeout. And some restaurants benefited in some sense by having a lot of online orders. But not all restaurants benefited from a wide range of, you know, partners that they used. And the more I read about it, I felt that a, a company that is squarely what I call as the right side of history is squarely in the camp of the restaurants. Uh, and their mission is super aligned with the restaurant's mission. And, you know, an online ordering platform on a subscription basis is actually a very, very powerful way for restaurants to be successful. So I read about that. And then I was very fortunate to sort of, you know, they were looking for a leader. So you might like the industry and like the uh, the kind of players there, but you know, you also have to have a job in terms of an opening. So I was uh, a little bit fortunate that uh, Chauna had an opening and I started talking to them in February and March. And I would say those three things in my post, which is it's rare to find founders uh, with that level of tenacity, right? They've been unwavering their mission. So both Chris Webb and Eric Jaffe since 2011, you know, that has been their mission. Their mission has been to sort of build technology for the smaller restaurants to operate well and with technology that is as good as a larger chain. So it's not just about online ordering, it's also about digital marketing, it's also about how to manage your customer data. So all of that. So that vision for the industry and for the company has, you know, was unwavering. So that was very you know, powerful and motivating. And then back to my original question, you've got to have some transformative challenge. And 
and Chow now has done so well over the last, uh, I would say, 18 months, where you know we look at our statistics, we have done, we have doubled our number of restaurants that we support, our restaurant partners. So we have some really interesting scaling challenges for the company, and it's really a, a combination of you know taking it from good to great, and that was interesting, like the ability to work in an environment where the skills I bring from Amazon, the skills I bring from all the other places I work are super relevant to the to the challenges that you know Chana was facing and my team is facing. So that was the second reason. And the third is, you know, you want to be in a purposeful, mission-driven company. And not just the founders who have the tenacity, but we have a great board, uh, you know, our investors are super supportive. And that is just an amazing opportunity for any executive. And uh, so the, these are all the three things that I sort of shared in the post, but you know, as I expand on it, uh, I've been here for two months and I'm super thrilled and super delighted to be here. And nothing has changed for me. Like my, like I was, if you go back, the amount of research I did for Amazon in 2006, right? That's just the way I am. So I did a tremendous amount of research on Chow Now too, right? And two months in, I can tell you that the company has, you know, exceeded all my expectations. I have a awesome job. I'm, I'm working for a great group of, uh, you know, I have a part of an executive team that's amazing. Um, you know, reporting to Chris Webb and the CEO is, is awesome. I have a good team that I've inherited. So it's a really good, powerful story to build upon. And I think it has a lot of, uh, there's a lot of elements yet to be said, right? We have two, three years, four years of hard work ahead of us as we scale our platforms and systems and tools and technologies. What comes to mind when I listen to this is, is first of all, you say that uh, you were lucky that the job post was open. I think they consider themselves just as lucky as you do. Uh, and also the trend is, is dispersion, is uh, reducing the technological and or financial barrier. So right right along with what Chow now is, is, is doing for, for any restaurant that simply has to exist in the most precious advertising space in the world, which is those couple inches that we hold also dearly in our hands every day. Right. So in terms of the articles that you mentioned, there's one that I've recently seen, and I'm sure that we're going to drop it in the comments uh, as well. It was from Food and Wine, and they highlighted how Chow Now is a, is a game changer. So the question, let's bifurcate it into two. What is the game and what's being changed? Uh so this is food and wine, uh, and we will drop the article in the comments. So they recognized us for uh, fairness, and they recognized us for fairness. And you know what I said, the vision of the company has not changed. And we are trying to build tools that level the playing field. You know, just to digress a little bit, when I was part of Amazon business, the thing that I really liked about that business model among many things, is that we did help small businesses get access to you know, preferential pricing, commercial grade, office products, and everything else. So anything that we can do to help level the playing field for a small business is a very powerful and motivating mission. And Charles Schwab did that with the advisory services division. That's what I was part of. So coming to Chow Now and the article that we liked, uh, the article recognizes the fact that we have been investing in helping build systems and technology and sometimes even processes for restaurants to help scale. And we haven't changed in that one bit. And that investment is not just in the online ordering software. It's also in the digital marketing initiatives. It's also with how restaurants can do a better job of marketing to diners. Uh, and the article speaks to you know, in the current environment where there has been a lot of contentious issues between the, the fees that other partners to these restaurants charge, we come across as something very different and refreshingly different. And we have stayed the same for a long time. So I, I really loved the fact that we were recognized and, uh, you know, kudos to Chris and Eric for, you know, staying the course. And 10 years later, and uh, this is amazing. This is just uh, this is also another reason why, you know, we would love uh, folks who are inspired with mission to join us, like how I've joined. 
Okay, yeah, you did mention 10 years. It, it was founded in 2011, so, Yes, uh, yes. And, and the uh, founding the premise, I'm sorry to interrupt you, the founding premise has not changed one bit, right? The intention of the business mm -hmm. in 2011 has been more or less the same. And of course, the industry has changed and we'd like to uh, go with that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm pretty sure that back in 2011, there was no anticipation of the yes. uh, 20 onwards, but I guess this just further validates the existence uh, of, of, of Chow now. Um, so we have the link in the comments. So anybody who's listening, dive right in. You have the food and wine, uh, food and wine article over there. And so more precisely on the space or the, the industry, I'm not sure if it can be called the industry, but rather the, the restaurant side of the space. Uh, what are the current issues and how is Chow now positioned to help? There are many, as the article calls out, and you read the blog on get.chana.com. Uh, restaurants, for now, for example, the most acute issue right now is staffing in the industry. So restaurants are opening up, you know, as the pandemic slowly abates and uh, local municipalities and cities and states open up in the United States, at least. Uh, restaurants are finding it hard to find, uh, you know, associates and uh, workers would want to come back and work. So productivity becomes a big aspect of what they want to do. Uh, they want to balance the investments in in-person dining as opposed to online ordering, right? They have to be thoughtful about both the experiences. Uh, so it all boils down to can restaurants build a sustainable business with just online ordering? It is very challenging. And you know, having a, a good partner like Chano helps. But there is so many other aspects of the industry that are also going through some change. Uh, there is, you know, if you look at what's happening in the industry, there is cloud kitchens, there are uh, other headwinds that the industry is facing. Uh, there are challenges with, you know, local laws that keep changing quite a bit. Uh, they now added beverages that they could, you know, you could actually deliver as well, which is good in a very big way. So restaurants are dealing with a lot of change. And in the middle of, you know, opening up, uh, it is challenging. There's no doubt about it. It's not steady state behavior. Uh, so, so I think it's not just us as a company, but there are many others in the industry who are going to help uh, restaurants. Okay. Um, so, I'm thinking if I have a follow-up question. I see that we have a couple of questions sort of directly to you, uh, aiming at your CTO experience in the comments. So, yeah. pretty sure we will be picking up. Uh, I have my last two questions. Okay. Before. I've been into right. that. They're slightly connected to what the audience is asking. So the question number one for me is, what's your decision-making framework? And this can be a rule of thumb. This can be as narrow as you want, as wide as you need. The simplest example would be cake. Is it good? Yes. Is it good for me? Probably not in the amounts that I would imagine ingesting myself. So in, in, uh, in, a, in a parallel, any tips that you can share with other C-level executives how to improve decision-making or how you face even the toughest challenge and just say, okay, if this, then that, this logic. Yeah. Go. So I, I remember reading a, an article a long time ago on a technique called reflective analysis, where you sort of write down the assumptions behind a decision and you sort of, you know, short form, you sort of capture why you made the decision and then Six months later, one year later, you go back and you know read it again. Obviously, we are we have such busy lives. There is no way you can write down every decision you're going to make every day or every week. That doesn't work. So what I've found useful to me personally is I always write down uh, the reasons when I accept a new role or within the same company, or when I leave companies and change jobs. I write down the pros and cons, and I go back six months or a year later to sort of read it. So. Through a process of 15, 20 years, I've used this technique for the biggest decisions I need to make, I've needed to make. And I found that that sort of improves your overall uh, thinking process behind decisions. A minor digression, uh, Jeff Bezos recently, I don't know when, which year, but he, he wrote like a one and a half page. Uh, it's in this book that I'm reading right now. It's called, uh, I'm not selling this book. This is the pub everything in this book is in the public domain. 
But for six bucks, you get it all in one simple place and you can just flip on it, right? You can read it, you can Google it, and you'll get the same data. One of the things uh, Jeff uh, mentioned is he sets aside uh, his mornings between 10 a.m. and noon for the most high quality decisions he needs to make. Uh, that's a big part of his, uh, you know, secret sauce, if you will. He needs eight hours of sleep, as the article says, and he sets aside this time. So one is, you know, you've got to be in the zone to make good decisions. So you've got to be fully immersed in you know, doing it at late night at 9 p.m. is kind of challenging. Sometimes you've got to do decisions all throughout the day. That's not the point. Point is, how do you make sure you're set up for success? So one is, you know, you pick your own productivity driver in the moment of the day. The second aspect is actually writing down. Like a lot of us, uh, you know, hesitate to put pen to paper. We have our thoughts in our head. Uh, sometimes people use dialogue. They, you know, toss around different ideas. Uh, they discuss with, you know, a board member or a peer or, you know, partner or, a, you know, direct. And they use dialogue for clarifying your decision making. But writing it down with pros and cons and long form helps clarify your thinking. And that's a, another part of the secret sauce of Amazon is this long form writing. The long form writing culture at Amazon is not just about making sure that you can communicate better or you have a better shot at executing because everything is now clear. There's an end to end thinking. There's a, another aspect of that, which is improving the decision making. Like it improves decision making at the exec levels. And uh, a recent book uh, sort of pointed this out. So I think it's a little bit of knowing when you're most productive and how to set aside time. And then the second part of it is actually writing it down so that it clarifies your thoughts. And you don't need to share your thoughts too. I mean, you could write it down for years. And that's how I think you get to the point of decision making. I'll say the last thing on this one is not all decisions are equal, right? Some decisions are reversible. Like you can choose to do it. If it doesn't work out, you can back out of it. Right? You can run an experimental pilot program, call it a beta, try it out. If it doesn't work out, you can back out of it. You don't have to go to GA. So these are what, as, what at least Jeff calls it two-way doors. So when you have a lot of two-way doors where you can get in and out of a decision, it's OK to sort of experiment, learn from it, and then revisit the decision later. It's the one-way doors that a decision that is irreversible like you're making a bet and you can't walk away from it, or it's hard to take that down, is very difficult. For example, lowering prices to a large extent is a one-way door. Once you get into lowering, it's hard to raise prices if you're lowering prices consistently. It's very hard. You can do it for the right reasons. When input costs change, food costs change, that's fine. But you know there are some decisions that are hard because they're one-way doors. And then you know that's a, a aspect that's well, well documented. If you just Google one-way doors versus two-way doors, you'll get a lot of that uh, example. So I would say it's just summarize, picking that moment in the day that you're most productive, clarifying your thoughts better by using long-form writing, just even a one page, and then being thoughtful about is it a one-way or a two-way door. Really digging the one-way and two-way yeah. two door splits, uh, especially that usually we just get an answer for the question but i like how you handle this saying that you know there's different kinds of decisions to be expected and this is actually advice to everybody listening like uh decision fatigue it's real like the reason why you see mark zuckerberg wearing the same clothes all the time because he has one less decision on what to wear today and earlier in the day you get yourself before you had to make this decision about this minor thing or that major thing your head is just that much clearer and this applies yeah. to CTO, any C-suite, and every person really. So everybody take heed from this advice. Um, and we actually have a couple of questions from the audience that are linked to this. And I'd like to couple two. Um, one is from Tomasz, curious to hear some tips for tech leaders that are only now becoming CTOs. And the question that I'd love to link with that because they're quite familiar, advice for CTOs how to build a successful tech team. So. Oh. New VC question. building a successful tech team. That's a great question. So I think there is a little bit of a background context behind the question. So allow me to sort of just lay it out. Uh, it's always important to line up the, the skills that one brings to the table 
and the opportunities that are needed in that role and make sure there's a healthy amount of alignment. And so you're bringing some demonstrable success into the role. You also have some new challenges. So you're going to be thrilled because you're going to learn something new. You should not you know, get too far up beyond your comfort level because then it gets very intimidating. So there is a lineup between the opportunity on hand and your skills. So the framework I have always used to explain the opportunities is to understand the life cycle stage of the company. Is this company a seed round company, A round company, B round, C round, D round, and so on and so forth. And that helps understand the needs of the CTO for, uh, for that function. So I'll give you two contrasting examples. If one were to join a seed round, series A-ish company, as opposed to series D company, so what would be the sort of the distinguishing, uh, not just qualities, but tips and techniques. So the requirements of the role for a seed or a series A company is the, the CTO has to sort of be extraordinarily hands-on. It it's going to be a very small team, maybe five or six engineers or 10 engineers. So many cases, they need to be comfortable sometimes writing code, which is a requirement of the job. They need to be comfortable auditing, diving deep, sometimes even debugging, staying connected to the details. Because some of the decisions the CTO is going to do is going to keep this company grounded for like many, many years. Everybody starts off by building a monolith. But when you're building a monolith for your first, uh, you know, first product, you can think about what has to change three or five years from now. So having some thought into design of, you know, around that elements would help. So the requirements for the CTO to be successful in a C A series A are very different than a C or a D round. So let's paint a picture on the series C and D round. So by the C and D round, uh, the company has product market fit. If you add more capital, they can grow. Usually there is a some kind of a linear relationship between investment of capital and uh, revenue and growth. By adding a dollar of capital, you can get you know $4 of growth or some number like that, or whatever the metric that may be. So now you're looking at scaling the team, scaling the processes, hiring different kinds of talent. Hiring functional disciplines. So in the original C day series A, you know, eight or ten engineers, uh, full stack, a range of techniques, a range of uh, skill sets would help. But when you get to a C and D round, compliance becomes an issue, security becomes an issue, DevOps becomes an issue, program management becomes an issue. Well, when I say an issue, I mean that's a concern that you need to address. So you need to hire specialists for that. So your recruiting strategy will change quite a lot. So so that's why going back to the original question, if you were to build a successful tech team, as you know, uh, Maria has put it, and I think the previous, I forget, is it, uh, I don't know who asked the question, Thomas, I think. Uh, the first steps as you take, you have to look at the point in time the company is and baseline that and figure out what the first steps are. And then this, the next step is very sequential. Very few companies go from a seed round to a D round, right? It just doesn't happen. So there is some level of uh, maybe discontinuous, but there's a step function change to the role. And if you go from A, B, and C, you're basically scaling the organization. So your first steps have to uh, sort of compensate for the environment in which the company is operating and the needs of the role. I'll add one more topic, which is the, the direction the company is headed in, which is are you poised for like a hockey stick growth? Is scaling the biggest concern? Are you in an environment where regulation becomes super critical? That means you cannot get something wrong. Like let's say you're in you know, a distributed blockchain technology company, but in payments or financial services. If you get one black mark from a regulator, that could put the company behind for several years. So speed does not matter there, right? Making sure that you're purposeful and deliberate in your product, ensuring that you're on the right side with the regulators, putting a lot of effort into controllership and governance. Those features take more precedence than anything else. Let's say you are in an environment where there is ferocious competition. Like if you look at what uh, in the last five, seven years, any company that's gone public, they've had to scale despite competition. They've done really well. So the environment for that company is very different where they may be taking A, B and C rounds very, very quickly, right? The last three years, you've seen companies that have gone from raising 20, 30 million dollars to raising half a billion dollars all in like a two to three year time frame. So the requirements for the CTO is, is actually, I have a phrase I'd like to use, is 
are you hiring for the challenges of today or are you hiring for the opportunities of tomorrow so when the ceo hires a cto are they hiring someone who's good enough for the next year or two or good enough for the next 3 to 5 years and if the company is not growing rapidly this this uh, question is meaningless but if the company is going rapidly this question is actually very very important to address so i think i've always used this a b c d rounds as a framework to explain the challenges of the company and that's how i think any anyone should take this job and sort of uh, apply themselves so not a nugget of wisdom but rather an entire gold mine uh, i'm pretty sure that all the c suite and technical uh, personnel watching this will definitely benefit from hearing this advice um doesn't seem like we have any more questions just comments about pen to paper and i must admit i recently rekindled that relationship myself since school we haven't talked too much paper pen and myself but recently uh just like you mentioned there is a completely different relationship between the thoughts and the output yeah. and just the visual aspect of it and the irreversibility unless you're using a pencil um but speaking of things like a pen or a pencil i am handing you a metaphorical wand remotely and i would like you to wave that wand tell me abracadabra and as a result of that spell casting all of a sudden all of the 12 year olds in the world are able to learn something and let's assume that they all want to we've heard emotional intelligence financial prudence design thinking whatever <laughs> it is i just want you to make it yours and tell me what is it that you think that those 12 year olds by the time that they will be 22 that skill would be the best skill that would help them excel in life that is a very uh, very interesting question and i'm going to give you a uh, sort of a very different answer and uh, an answer that sort of is uh, a philosophy that i share very deeply with my wife who has sort of taught me this uh, a little bit and i have to you know thank her for it i'm going to say that you know 12 year olds are different by generation so i i was born in the early 70s and when i was 12 in early 80s i, I was born and raised in india and it's a very different set of challenges uh, and the divide between a developing country and a developed country was quite stark there was no internet there was no mtv there was no youtube there's no instagram there's no facebook there's nothing to level right so given that I'm, this is this magic wand example is for an existing 12 year old that someone was born in you know, 2009 or 2010 uh, or near about so what i would call as the folks who were born after the iphone was invented right my uh personal philosophy on this is 12 year olds should really spend time having the best possible childhood they can get and they will not get this chance again right childhood just goes off in a blink and today when you know i visit i have I have uh, a niece and a nephew in austin um, my wife's sister lives there so we visit for holidays and i have sometimes seen my nephew meeting with his friends and they're all sitting in a circle they're all playing a game together none of them are talking right they're all playing a game but it's a very shared experience and they're taking comfort in the fact that they're all in the same you know 30 square feet of space but they're playing a worth a game but they're going to play it in their homes they're going to play it sitting in the closet for all you care but they will want to meet so i think the the opportunity to have a beautiful childhood is probably the most important thing that one can sort of double click on everything else will sort of come into play right if you have a good childhood and you come out as a grounded and a healthy individual you'll make good choices you'll get make good lifestyle choices you'll figure out what you want to study you'll figure out you don't want to study you want to be a musician you want to be an artist right you'll figure that out but coming out as pragmatic and grounded is sort of probably the most important thing and today there's so much of focus on mental health and it's so challenging for kids um so If there's anything we can do as society is to give great childhoods, and that's what we should do. I got to hand it to you. Knocked it out of the park. And apologies to every previous guest speaker, but this answer hands down wins. Uh, I'm sorry. I love it personally, and I'm pretty sure that it just refers to the fact that if the foundation is solid, then you don't need to think yeah. about teaching a specific skill. So, 
there is a interesting uh, debate happening in india right now where there is a lot of companies that are uh, pushing younger children to create apps uh, like mobile apps like phone sure. apps right and it's like you don't need to do this now you can do this when you're older like there are some kids who love programming at the age of 10 11 and 12 start companies when they're 18 and are fantastic at what they do because they were early enough to figure out what they like but somebody gave them freedom to do what they like and that's it all boils down to that but i should not take too much credit for this philip i think i owe it to my wife geeta uh, because i've learned this from her uh, if you know if i were not married her i don't think i'd have been thinking it around these lines which just goes further to what you say that the solid foundation will yeah. take care of everything that's built on top of that so absolute kudos to her and that was the last question that i had i don't see any other questions in the comments we're hitting the 40 minute mark so uh other than thanking you for being an excellent guest speaker i wanted to ask is there any closing remark anything even more inspiring if that's possible that I, you'd love to leave the I audience said, no thank you i think one thing i would say is investing in learning like a lot of us uh invest in learning and our foundational years you know 18 to 25 grad school undergrad maybe a masters program phd and then we invest in learning through osmosis learning at work learning by doing something learning the hard school of knox learning by failing right you learn in all different ways but i have found that you know every year taking two to three days off attending a course attending a class which is now easier because of zoom uh i think even a structured approach to learning i think really helps uh, you know take some time off and, and and invest in yourself uh that i think is one thing i have sort of learned and practice fantastic and that's a wrap so thank you bharat and thank you everybody who attended thank you for your questions and uh all i have to say is that just like every tuesday next tuesday we'll be seeing you for yet another episode of disruption talk so thanks for attending thanks for being here bharat and thank you. see you next tuesday everyone bye bye right, take care bye